Got your Bible with you? Open up to the book of Exodus, chapter 26. Going back in time a little bit today. Uh, as, as you know, we've been studying through the book of Exodus and we've been dealing with the tabernacle in these past few weeks. And today we've actually come to the place where we're going to talk about the actual structure of the tabernacle. We've talked about all the items that are inside it, all the items that are outside it. Now we're going to actually talk about the tent itself. And so we're going to do that by reading chapter 26 where we see God's instructions to Moses. Here's how I want you to build it. Here's what I want it to look like. Here's what I want it to be made out of. All of this stuff. And so as we do that, we're going to look at how it was made, what it looked like, but also what did it represent? What does it mean when we look at it as New Covenant believers, what does this mean for us? And the picture that came to mind of the tabernacle was, uh, was like an engagement ring. This is this picture that I had in my head of an engagement ring because an engagement ring represents three things. It represents the past, the relationship that has led up to this point. It represents the present. A proposal took place. Hopefully she said yes. We're, we're now engaged, we're in preparation for this, but it also points to the future. The engagement is not the end. You're looking forward to a marriage, to spending your life together, to be dedicated, to becoming one flesh. And so the tabernacle is very much the same. It, it was a picture of the past, of God releasing them from slavery, providing for them in the desert, bringing them and to the wilderness, making a covenant with them, and now wanting to dwell with them. This is all a reminder of everything God had done. It was a picture of and a reminder of God's presence right then. I mean, when you wake up in the morning, you open your tent, and you see the tabernacle complex, God's there. It's a representation of God being there, His presence with the people. And then it's a picture of the future. It's a picture of what is to come. The tabernacle and later the temple are temporary. And they're a picture of what is to come in the Messiah, in Jesus, and the relationship that we will have with Him, a marriage that will be eternal. And so this, the tabernacle is a picture of these things. Now, the, if, if you're married, you probably remember the engagement phase is, is fun. It's kind of a cool time and it's really exciting um, and everybody does it a little differently for a different amount of time. We were engaged for not quite a year and a half. And it was really fun. And then about, you know, two months in, you're like, all right, I'm ready to move on to the next part. I want to get married. And, and so it's, it's fun. It's, it's new. It's fresh. It's exciting. But you can't wait to get to what's coming. And that's what the tabernacle shows us. This is a real thing that took place. This was exciting. God was dwelling with his people. But the more exciting thing is what's to come in the Messiah and in the future. And so as we look at this, we're going to see how the tabernacle points to something far greater and far more beautiful in the future. Now, I will say, as we've been studying this, I, I want to make, make sure we understand. As we've been studying this, we've been talking about the symbols and what they mean and how it relates to Jesus. And, and this is very important. It's very important as we study Scripture. But we have to be careful that we don't go overboard. And there are some who do. Uh, there is some danger in over-symbolizing everything in Scripture. Scripture means what it says. Very literally, it means what it says. And now there are pictures and symbols in Scripture of other things, like Jesus, like we've been talking about. Uh, but we can't look at every word in Scripture and, and try to figure out, what is this symbolizing? What does that symbolize? We, it can get a little messy. So there are some wonderful pictures and symbols in the tabernacle, but it's also a picture of a very real thing that's happening at that time, and that was God coming to dwell in the midst of His people. That really happened. And, and so it's an exciting time for them. So we're going to read the entire 26th chapter of Exodus and see God's instructions. Now remember, we're talking now about God giving the instructions to Moses on the mountain. It's not going to be until later where they actually come back and build it. And so as we get later in the book, we'll, we'll touch on some of that, but we're not going to go into detail about all these things because some of it 
repeats what God has already said here. So here is God's instruction to Moses for the building of the tabernacle. Moreover, you shall make the tabernacle with ten curtains of fine twine linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns. You shall make them with cherubim skillfully worked into them. The length of each curtain shall be 28 cubits and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. All the curtains shall be the same size. Five curtains shall be coupled to one another and the other five curtains shall be coupled to one another. And you shall make loops of blue on the edge of the outermost curtain in the first set. Likewise, you shall make loops on the edge of the outermost curtain in the second set. Fifty loops you shall make on, one, on the one curtain, and fifty loops you shall make on the edge of the curtain that is in the second set. The loops shall be opposite one another, and you shall make fifty clasps of gold and couple the curtains one to another with the clasps so that the tabernacle may be a single whole. You shall also make curtains of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Eleven curtains you shall make. The length of each curtain shall be thirty cubits, and the breadth of each curtain four cubits. The eleven curtains shall be the same size. You shall couple five curtains by themselves and six curtains by themselves, and the sixth curtain you shall double over at the front of the tent. You shall make fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in one set, and fifty loops on the edge of the curtain that is outermost in the second set. You shall make fifty clasps of bronze, and put the clasps into the loops, and couple the tent together that it may be a single whole, and the part that remains on the curtains of the tent, the half curtain that remains, shall hang over the back of the tabernacle. And the curtain that remains in the length of the curtains, the cubit on the, on the one side and the cubit on the other side, shall hang over the sides of the tabernacle on this side and that side to cover it. And you shall make for the tent a covering of tanned ram skins and a covering of goat skins on top. Verse 15, you shall make upright frames for the tabernacle of acacia wood. Ten cubits shall be the length of a frame and a cubit and a half the breadth of each frame. There shall be two tenons in each frame for fitting together. So you shall do for all the frames of the tabernacle. You shall make the frames for the tabernacle. Twenty frames for the south side, and forty bases of silver you shall make under the twenty frames, two bases under one frame for its two tenons, and two bases under the next frame for its two tenons. And for the second side of the tabernacle on the north side, twenty frames, and there forty bases of silver, two bases under one frame, and two bases under the next frame. And for the rear of the tabernacle westward you shall make six frames, and you shall make two frames for corners of the tabernacle in the rear. They shall be separate beneath, but joined at the top, at the first ring. Thus, it sh thus shall it be with both of them. They shall form the two corners, and there shall be eight frames with their bases of silver, sixteen bases, two bases under one frame, and two bases under another frame. Verse 26, you shall make bars of acacia wood, five for the frames of the one side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the other side of the tabernacle, and five bars for the frames of the side of the tabernacle at the rear westward. The middle bar halfway up the frame shall run from end to end. You shall overlay the frames with gold, and shall make their rings of gold for holders for the bars, and you shall overlay the bars with gold. Then you shall erect the tabernacle according to the plan for it that you were shown on the mountain. And you shall make a veil of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen. It shall be made with cherubim skillfully worked into them. And you shall hang it on four pillars of acacia overlaid with gold, with hooks of gold on four bases of silver. And you shall hang the veil from the clasps and bring the ark of the testimony in there within the veil. And the veil shall separate for you the holy place from the most holy. You shall put the mercy seat on the ark of the testimony in the most holy place. And you shall set the table outside the veil and the lampstand on the south side of the tabernacle opposite the table, and you shall put the table on the north side. You shall make a screen for the entrance of the tent of blue and purple and scarlet yarns and fine twine linen embroidered with needlework. And you shall make for the screen five pillars of acacia and overlay them with gold. Their hooks shall be of gold, and you shall cast five bases of bronze for them. Whew, got it? 
So are you ready to build a tabernacle now? So I know you may be thinking, why do we have to read all that? Well, it doesn't hurt to read God's Word anytime. So, so we want to look at this. But let me kind of give you the picture. God gives Moses the specific plans. Here's exactly what I want you to do. The exact measurements, what I want you to make it out of, how it's going to be constructed. It will be, in our measurements, 45 feet long, 15 feet wide, 15 feet tall, a big rectangle. It will be separated into two compartments, the holy place and the most holy place, or what we usually call the holy of holies. The holy place will be 30 feet long, and the holy of holies will be 15 feet long, a 15 by 15 by 15 cube. He says that the construction will be a wooden frame overlaid with gold with crossbars and rings to support it. And then silver bases will be underneath each of these frames. And then on top of this framework, there will be four layers of different materials. Now, what we learn from this is that the frame, you'll see if you, if you uh, do we have a picture there, Barbara? There we go. So you see in this picture, now again, we don't have any pictures of the actual, ta actual tabernacle, but you see on the inside, you can see the framework. Some pictures you look, if you go Google it, you'll see pictures that have solid gold walls, wooden, wooden walls overlaid with gold, solid. But when you read about it, you see that the, the fine twine linens that are over the top would not be seen if you couldn't see through the framework. So the best understanding is this is kind of a latticework wood frame overlaid with gold because on top of it, the first layer you have is these fine twine linens laying over the top of the tabernacle so you can see it through the walls. Then on top of that, you have cloth made of goat hair which, by the way, was, you know, you had a, a lot of goats, so you had a lot of goat hair. If you, if you did it well, if you wove it together finely enough, it was very uh, sturdy, very protective against the elements. On top of that, you have ram skinned, which were dyed red as the third layer. And then on the outer layer, this is, look in your Bible and see what, what your Bible says. Uh, but in here, in what we read in the ESV, this is verse 14. In the ESV, it says uh, goat skins. If you're reading the NIV, it says sea cows. If you're reading the King James, it says badger skin. Uh, so it's very uh, widely translated. And, and there's a lot of debate on what kind of skin was on the outside. We know the word actually means some sort of animal skin. The best understanding as far as I can tell according to the language is that there's some kind of marine animal. Like the NIV says, a sea cow. It was called a dugong in that region. Some people say a porpoise, and your Bible may actually say that. I know that's sad to think about flipper, but, <clears throat> but the, the reason that's preferred is because the language of it, but also the practicality of it. Imagine a tent well, if, if you've ever gone camping, what do you put on the outside of your tent? You put a rain fly over it that is waterproof that keeps the rain out. Well, what would be the best thing to put on top of your tent? How about the skin of some animal that lives in water? So it, it makes sense that this would be some sort of, of marine mammal that would give this tent somewhat of a waterproof covering on the outside. And being right near the Red Sea, these animals were uh, very plentiful, they would have been able to, to find that very easily. And so you see again, we don't know exactly what those would have looked like, but you see the layers on top laid over this rectangular building. And then in the inside, you have this veil that separates the two different compartments, the holy place and the most holy place, with cherubim on it. Remember we said when we studied the Ark of the Covenant that the cherubim are, are depicted as guarding or protecting God's glory. So they are there separating the room where God's glory resides. So what we're going to look at today is five things. What, what does this all mean? When we look at the actual tabernacle, what does this all mean? And the first thing we see in this, number one, God has come to dwell with man. God has come to dwell with man. Now he's been there. 
He's in the pillar of cloud, the pillar of fire. He showed up on the mountain. He's been providing for them. But now God has a dwelling place, or he will. Right now he's just getting the instructions for it, but God is going to have a dwelling place. And this tabernacle, as we've said before, is, is impressive, but small. It's not very large. It is meant to be able to be packed up and carried to the next spot and then put back up. It is small, but it is impressive, costly, made of, with gold and silver and bronze and other costly materials made by skilled master craftsmen. And so it was God's dwelling place for himself with man in the middle of the camp. Wherever they would go, they would set this up. And you notice in the instructions, it is facing a certain direction. This wall faces north. This wall faces west. And then the tents face around it, facing in toward it. This is how God designed it, in the middle of the camp. So God can now dwell with man, and man has God living in his presence. But the, the reality of this is God doesn't need a tent to live in. Scripture is clear on that. God doesn't live in temples made by human hands, it says in Acts. God doesn't need a temple. He doesn't need a tabernacle. He doesn't need any of this stuff. He could have chosen any way to dwell with man. He could have stayed with the pillar of cloud and fire. He could have been in a cloud of smoke enveloping the entire camp. He could have, he could have manifested himself in a little glowing ball at each person's tent. Everybody has God's presence there. He could have done it that way. He could have literally manifested his presence in any way he desired. But his desire was to have this tabernacle and this is where his glory would dwell. And this picture that we see in this is the establishment of structure and what we might call organized religion. And that has kind of taken on a bad connotation in recent years. People, even within the church, we don't like organized religion. You know, it's not about religion. It's about a relationship. And that's true. But God is the one that, that really designed this. What we see in this is that God has a specific way for man to relate to him. We come to God on his terms, not on our terms. And so when we look at this, we see the, the development of what we might call organized religion. The word religion, again, has kind of taken on... Uh, it's kind of become a bad word for a lot of people, but the word literally means that it means the belief in and worship of a higher power. Very simply. In our case, it is the belief in and worship of Almighty God. That's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. And so when we look back in Exodus, we see God establishing an organized and systematic way for man to relate to him. This is how you come to me. This is where I dwell, and this is the, the rules and regulations for how you come to me. There is a specific way that mankind could come to God properly, prescribed by God himself, and this is, by definition, organized religion. And what we see in this, and what we realize in this simply is, when religion is organized by God, it's good. When religion is organized by man, it's bad. When we do it ourselves, it's a bad thing. And so the tabernacle, with all of its furnishings and all of the stuff that relates to it, tells us one important thing. If we want to come to God, we have to come on His terms. He's the one that sets the terms for the relationship. This is why we have so many false religions in our world. Because man is on a hunt for purpose, for meaning, for uh, a relationship with some higher power, and we really mess it up when we try to do it our way. We try to figure out how to get to God instead of looking in the Bible and saying, God, how do you want us to come to you? Because he tells us. And so we see this, what we would call organized religion, where God says, this is where I am, this is how you come to me, this is the right way, and no other way works. Very simply. As we spoke of last week, the entrance to the tabernacle, both the courtyard and to the actual tabernacle itself, there's one way in. There's one 
entrance to the courtyard and there's one entrance to the tabernacle. That's the only way in. And we know this is God's way that he has designed. And in our context, we know that this way is Jesus. He is the way. He said at John 14, 6, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. John chapter 10, verses 7 through 10, Jesus says this. Jesus again said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, I am the door of the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not listen to them. I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. Jesus says, I'm the door. Right before that, if you want to read a little bit later in John chapter 10, he talks about the fact that there's, there's one entrance to the sheepfold, and anyone that comes in any other way is a thief and a robber. They're out to be destructive. They climb over the fence. They sneak in somehow. That's not the way to come in. There's one way in, and that is through Jesus. So this picture that God paints in the tabernacle is that he has come to dwell with man, and when he does, there is one way for mankind to relate to him. It's his way, the way he's designed. But he's also doing something else. He's also preparing for the Messiah. This is all in preparation for the Messiah. He was not just prescribing the means by which his people would seek him. He's establishing unmistakable pictures of the Messiah who would come later. You know, Jesus, we talked about last week, Jesus is God coming to dwell with man. Just like God came in the tabernacle, Jesus came to dwell with people. He's the radiance of God's glory. He's the exact imprint of his nature. He's the image of the invisible God coming to dwell with mankind. So when he came to earth, he's doing something very similar to what God did when he came to dwell in the tabernacle. When God gives his design for the tabernacle to Moses, it's not just establishing his means by which mankind could come to him. It is showing future generations a picture of the coming Messiah. And I hope in the past few weeks and and months as we've studied this, you've had a few of those moments where you've been like, oh, now I see why that's so important, or now I see what that means. When we study scripture like this, we realize it's not an accident how God has woven together Scripture as a tapestry with everything pointing to Jesus. He did it on purpose. It's not just that throughout the centuries theologians have gone back and tried to force pieces of the puzzle into place. God put it all together in a beautiful tapestry that all makes sense. And when we start to see it, we see that He was preparing us for the Messiah even back in these days. So God has come to dwell with man, but we see the second thing, our second point today, even though God has come to dwell with man, there is still a separation. There is still separation between God and man. He's come to dwell with them, but there is still a measure of separation And this is also part of God's design, ultimately to point to Jesus, who will be the one to come and remove that separation permanently. And we see the separation in several ways in the tabernacle. First, we see the fence, the courtyard fence that surrounds the whole complex, 10 foot high fence surrounding the entire place. Later on, when the temple is built, we see that There are different areas for different groups of people. There's a court for the Gentiles. There's a court for the women. There's a court for the men. There's the area for the priests. And then you have the inside the temple, the same as the tabernacle, the holy place, and the holy of holies. In the tabernacle, you don't have all these different areas. You have the courtyard, and you have the tabernacle, which has the holy of holies. You could, according to Leviticus chapter 1, if you were an Israelite, You could come into the complex to offer a sacrifice. It says in Leviticus 1, if you're going to come offer a sacrifice, you're going to lay your hand on the top of that, on the head of that animal while it's slaughtered. As you identify with that animal that is being killed for your sin. So obviously people had to come into the complex to the bronze altar. 
Now, we don't know from that scripture if that's just a certain group of people, possibly just men, because they're all masculine pronouns in that passage. So we don't know if women were even allowed in there or children. And it could have been a, a husband or father that had to do that for his family. So you have an area in the courtyard where some of the Israelites could come in. No foreigners could come in. And then, you know, you, you can't go any further than that. So you have this area that is, is more exclusive. You have next the, the entrance to the tabernacle. So even if you're allowed to come into the, the courtyard, unless you're a priest, you can't go any further into the tabernacle. The, the priests were only allowed to go into the tabernacle when they've made, been made ceremony, ceremonially clean by washing in the bronze basin that we talked about last week. And even at that, as far as we can tell in Scripture, you could only enter for specific duties as a priest. You can't just go hang out in there to get away from all the people. If you were performing your priestly duties, you could enter into the tabernacle. Beyond that, we see the veil that marks off the Holy of Holies. And past that, the only person that can go is the high priest one day a year on the Day of Atonement. What you're seeing here is the closer you get to God's presence, the more exclusive the group is. There is still a separation between God and man. The other thing we see in this is the, the part of the construction of the tabernacle in the fine twine linens. This is really interesting. He says the, the cover over the top, the first layer, is made of fine twine linens. The, the veil from the Holy of Holies and the veil for the entrance is made of this. Later on in Scripture... In Deuteronomy and in Leviticus, we see a prohibition made for wearing any garments that are made of multiple materials. Kind of an interesting thing. Like your, you know, 50-50 cotton polyester blend shirt you're wearing right now, can't wear that. Can't have something made of two different materials. God wouldn't allow it. And you look back and say, why? What a weird thing to prohibit. But what we see is, here in the tabernacle, you have these materials made of different, or these cloths made of different materials. And also in the garment that the high priest wears, you have the same sort of thing. And what God is doing is he is picturing the, how exclusive the tabernacle and the priesthood is. Essentially, God's saying, no one else can have clothing like me. No one else can be clothed like my dwelling place and my high priest. It's exclusive. No one else can have something like this. And so there's this further separation. And this separation in all these different ways we've seen is an indication that this is a temporary setup. This is not final. Something more is coming. There's an engagement that's taken place, but the wedding hasn't come yet. The marriage hasn't been consummated yet. And so God is saying this is temporary. There's more to come in God's relationship with man and that is found in Jesus, who, who will fulfill the old covenant with all the restrictions and regulations. He's going to fulfill all that. He's going to tear the veil that separates man from God so that we can come boldly before his throne because Jesus made a way. So we see in the tabernacle, God's come to dwell with man, yet there is still a separation. The third thing we see here is that the tabernacle has... No beauty or majesty on the outside. This is a very interesting contrast between the inside and the outside of the tabernacle. The inside's filled with gold, silver, bronze, fine linens, all of this wonderful, beautiful, valuable stuff. The outside, not so much. If you were to walk by and see it, you probably wouldn't think too much of it. If, if we are correct in the fact that the outer layer was some sort of uh, a sea cow or porpoise, then basically the tabernacle from the outside looks like a big gray rectangle. Kind of dull, kind of blah, nothing too exciting. There's no windows. You can't see in, you know, you can't walk by and say, oh, it kind of looks not too special on the outside, but I see something shining inside. No, you can't see anything inside unless you go inside. The tabernacle from the outside was nothing special to behold. 
And for us, it depicts two things. First, Jesus. Contrary to popular artwork through the centuries, Jesus was likely not a strapping, handsome man with flowing, nicely straightened and conditioned hair and a halo over his head. Instead, the picture we have in Scripture is this, Isaiah 53, verse 2, He had no form or majesty that we should look at Him, and no beauty that we should desire Him. On the outside, Jesus was not a beautiful or handsome man. doesn't mean He was ugly or horribly disfigured or anything like that. It just means that His physical appearance had nothing that was particularly attractive to people. Because God wanted people to come to Jesus, not because he looked nice, but because of who he was and what he was teaching. In this way, Jesus was like the tabernacle. Not terribly impressive from the outside, but completely valuable and beautiful on the inside. The second thing this depicts is us as believers. We are to be defined by what's inside us, not what we look like on the outside. If we are truly saved by grace, then we have the Holy Spirit living in us. If we have the Holy Spirit living in us, we are supposed to be living out the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. And when we live out the fruit of the Spirit, when we are the light of the world, when we are the salt of the earth, people look and say, I want that. Not, man, he's good looking. And I'm very thankful for that. We don't draw people to Christ because we're beautiful and because we dress nice. We draw people to Christ by living a Christ-like, spirit-led life. We're like the tabernacle. We may not be too impressive on the outside, but inside lives the spirit of the living God. We are like the tabernacle. The fourth thing we see, and these, these last two are just... They kind of blow my mind. They're, it's amazing how God puts all this together in the big picture. But the fourth thing is the tabernacle is built on the atonement. This is a very interesting and beautiful picture. If you remember when we talked several weeks ago, the interior, the, the items for the construction of the tabernacle, including all the valuable materials inside, were given in a free will offering by the people. God said, ask the people to give whatever is in their heart to give. Gold and, and silver and bronze and gems and jewelry and linens and oils and spices and all this stuff. Ask the people to give these things as their heart moves them. But in the inside of the tabernacle, while most of the things are made of gold, there are items of silver, and those items of silver are, in verse 19, the bases of the framework of the tabernacle. So all of these wooden frames overlaid with gold along the inside of the tabernacle are on bases of silver. Most everything else is gold and some bronze, but these are made of silver. And so, so the people gave on a free will basis whoever's heart moves them, but there's an exception to this, and we read it in Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, verses 11 through 16, it says this, The Lord said to Moses, When you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. The shekel is 20 geras, half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and upward shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall not give more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel. When you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives, you shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting that it may bring the people of Israel to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. So... God says, give these items based on how your heart moves you. But one difference, when you do the census, everybody 20 years and older is to give half a shekel as atonement money. Now, we know atonement, according to Scripture, is made by blood. But there are times in Scripture where God makes 
other arrangements. And in this case, he says, this is the atonement money. You pay this as a ransom for your life, essentially. This is the atonement for your life. We, we see Exodus 38, verses 25 and 26, that the, what they gave was silver. It was silver shekels. So each person, 20 years and older, as atonement, gave half a shekel of silver as a tax of sorts, specifically given for atonement. Now, we, atonement it means a covering. In the Old Covenant, it was temporary. It was a covering for your sin temporarily until you had to have that covering renewed by another sacrifice. Jesus later would make permanent final atonement. But what we see here is that the entire structure of the tabernacle is laid on the foundation of these silver bases and the silver came as the atonement for the people. The entire tabernacle is built on the atonement of the people. And in the same way, our relationship with God is built on the atonement that's provided to us by Jesus on the cross. Everything rests on what He did on the cross. We have no hope of having any kind of relationship with God unless He provides atonement for us on the cross. Everything is built on that. And in the same way, in the tabernacle, everything is built on this silver, which was the atonement money that the people paid as a ransom for their lives. What a beautiful picture. Finally, the last thing we see, and we'll close with this. The tabernacle is built on the atonement, but it's covered by the blood. Not literally, mind you, but figuratively. <clears throat> Remember the, the four coverings on top of the tabernacle? There's, thank you for the picture. So you've got fine twine linens, you've got goat's hair, and then the third one is ram skins, and he specifically says to dye them red. Now, why in the world would you take the time to dye something red that's going to be covered on both sides? The only time you're ever going to see that is when you're taking the tabernacle down or putting it up. It would be like wearing four layers of clothes and really worrying about how nice your third layer of clothes are that nobody's going to see unless they're in your room when you take them off. You wouldn't really worry about it. Well, why worry about dyeing this third layer red that nobody or very few people are ever going to see? This is a picture of the blood. The blood of the sacrifices that are offered for the forgiveness of the people. And more importantly, and more permanently, the blood of Jesus that would be shed on our behalf. <clears throat> the blood in this case, is unseen, but it covers. And just like it is for us, the blood is unseen. We don't walk around with literal blood on us, but it covers us. The blood of Jesus covers us. And when God looks at us, He sees the blood of His Son. Now, what we learn in Scripture, it, it is, you know, then God would look in the blood, at the blood blood of the sacrifice and he would see the payment that was made by that sacrifice instead of seeing the sin of the, the person. For us, it is even more meaningful because when God looks, he doesn't just see the blood of, of an animal, he sees the blood of his son covering us. And more than that, not only do we have the blood, but Jesus says, or scripture says that we receive his righteousness. He gets our sin we get His righteousness. We're covered by the blood. We receive the righteousness. So when God looks at us, He sees the righteousness of Christ, not our sin. That's the beautiful picture. God looks at us. He sees the righteousness of Christ. He doesn't see our sin. Jesus took, it, took our sin, gave us His righteousness. And more than that, He's standing at the right hand of the Father, interceding on our behalf. As if you walked into a courtroom... And you're guilty. I mean, you're, you're as guilty as can be. And you walked into the courtroom and you're standing before the judge and he's about to pronounce your guilty sentence. But his son is standing next to him and he leans over and he says, this one's mine. I got this one covered. That's what it's a picture of. We're covered by the blood. 
if you are, if you are covered by the blood and planted firmly on the foundation of Jesus' atonement, everything else is going to work itself out. That's all we need. We don't need a big house. We don't need lots of money. We don't need lots of friends. We don't need to be beautiful. If we're covered by the blood and we are planted firmly on the foundation of Jesus' atonement, everything's going to be all right. Life is going to be okay. God tells us through the tabernacle, through these pictures, that we have to come to Him on His terms. He establishes how the relationship works. And the way it works is, according to Scripture, we come to Jesus by faith. We put all our trust, all our faith in Him and say, I can't do it. I need you to cover me. I need you to pay. You already have paid. I accept this gift that you've already paid on the cross. That's God's way. Just like the tabernacle, there's one way in. Into a relationship with God. For us, it's the same way. And so I'm going to pray and we're going to sing. But I want to tell you this morning, if you haven't ever taken that step, I mean, maybe you've been kind of in the camp. You see the tabernacle. You see what God has done. But you've never entered in through God's way, through Jesus Christ, into a relationship with Him. There is more to life than just being in the camp and being near God. There's a way to go into His actual presence. And it's through Jesus. And I want to invite you to do that today. I want to invite you to come as we sing. I'm going to be right down front here. would love to talk to you about a relationship with Jesus or anything else. If you need prayer, if you are uh, interested in, in a new church family and you want to unite with us, We would love to have you come and be a part of our church family. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to sing, and I would invite you to come. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you. We thank you for your shed blood that provided atonement. Not just temporarily, Lord. You didn't just cover our sins temporarily. You took them away. You cast them as far as the east is from the west. And we could never thank you enough for that. But I realize, Lord, there are people, potentially people in this room, that have never experienced your saving grace, who've never been covered by the blood, who've never placed their life on the foundation of your atonement. Maybe they've been around. Maybe they've been in the camp, Lord, but they've never come into your presence. I pray today would be the day. They would come not on their terms, but on your terms. By your grace, through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord, today would be the day that they receive that engagement ring. A promise for the future, which is an eternity with you. Lord, as we sing, I pray that you would be lifted up and glorified, and I pray that you would move in the hearts of anyone in this room and anybody at home that needs to make a decision, whatever that decision is, move in their hearts, compel them to take that step, Lord whether that's walking down an aisle or whether that's making a phone call or sending an email to start a conversation. Lord, I pray that you would compel them to do that today. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Do you stand with us? I'll be right down front. If you have a question, if you need somebody to pray with you, if you have a decision to make, I'll be right down here to talk to you.